podcasting from Dallas, Texas. I am Shireen, and this is the Yumlish Podcast. This episode of the Yumlish Podcast is made possible by Anchor. Anchor is a free and easy way to create a podcast. Their creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor also distributes your podcast for you, so it can be heard across Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Yumlish empowers people with chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes and heart disease to take charge of their health through diet. And this podcast is created to amplify the voices of patients, health professionals, employers, and community members who are working to reduce the risk of these chronic diseases and put your health first. Dr. Elon Shapiro talks to us about his journey to become a pediatric physician the impact of COVID-19 on minorities and specifically on Hispanic families. And lastly, he busts myths and misconceptions regarding COVID-19. Dr. Elon Shapiro has always had a passion to convert health information into action by improving the well-being of local communities he is the pediatric physician for Altamed, and he's also their medical director for health education and wellness. Welcome, Dr. Shapiro. How are you? Good. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an absolute pleasure having you on. So diving right in with that, Dr. Shapiro, uh, I want to learn a little bit more about your background, what led you to become an advocate for Hispanic health um, and, and pursue medicine in the way that you do. Well, um, I'm born and raised in Mexico City, a uh, small city, only 20 plus million people. And uh, my entire family came from different parts of the world and ended up in Mexico. That's why I have this uh, Ilan Shapiro uh, name, not a Mexican, and being completely uh, jalapeno prone. Then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there completely. Mm-hmm. Then uh, I had the pleasure to uh, do all my, my uh, medical, uh, you know, my medical degree there. Uh, I started actually working as a liaison between uh, the Secretary of Health and uh, the WHO early on after finishing my my MD degree, and I loved it. I, you know that transformation of understanding what was happening on the ground in little towns in Mexico and big cities in a, in, a, in a very complicated uh, and effective preventive uh, health system. And I ended up in the WHO where I was, you know, talking about problems at a global scale regarding public health policies, regarding alcohol, uh, uh, smoking, um, and other interesting topics that we were having at that moment. Um, and of course, you know, the health of, uh, of kids. I always wanted to be a pediatrician and I wanted to be an international doctor. And uh, in Spanish, when you translate public health policy, it translates to public health politics. There's really no good word for policy. Um, and it was when I was telling my family that I wanted to be an international doctor that does public health politics in Spanish, they were like, okay, you, you suffer so many years and now you're going to be a politician? You know, that doesn't make sense. And I ended up, uh, uh, thanks God, I, I, I actually, went, when they saw me in Geneva and, and doing public health stuff in the WHO, they, they kind of started glancing at it and go like, well, maybe he, he will be Okay, um, and um, I, I pursued my pediatric passion at the Mount Sinai Hospital in Chicago. Um, um, it's a urban, very complicated area of Chicago. Uh, it's a hospital that has been there for 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 a long a long time and has been serving any community that it's needed. And it was on the corner between the Puerto Rican, Mexican, African American, and different ganglands uh there and uh, you know the the middle point uh the hospital was where where everybody would would put difference aside and they, they will be safe and, and be taken care of and i understood the complicated part of 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 you know like the new world and you know how kids were you know social determinants of health the zip codes and and all this stuff and um 
I got to experience the H1N1 pandemic there. And uh, it was very frustrating for me to see that there were a lot of communications towards the community, but the, 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 the information was not being heard. And it was not because they didn't understand the language or, or anything, but it was the cultural aspect of it that we were missing it. And the information that we were giving with H1N1 was kind of, we're going to die. And, you know, and and, and the, the information of the community they were hearing is, you know, like if, if you're from a different community, you could actually get your, your immigration status revoked. And, you know, a lot of complicated stuff that you do not want to have when you have a pandemic. You want them to be make sure that if, if there's a medication or a vaccine that the case of H1N1, um, that you actually do something about it. And um, and I, I I created a couple of uh, good uh, public health uh, communication strategies with local, uh, you know, with the Mexican consulate, with a lot of the local newspapers and uh, Hispano, especially Hispano media, because it was not trickling down. Um, I was seeing, you know, a lot of late complications from just waiting at home and not, you know, just calling. And uh, I translated a lot of those stuff and I started actually communicating that um, in radio, TV and uh, written media. And I loved it. And I loved it. Why? Because, you know, in, in my regular day in my clinic in Chicago, I, I could see, you know, like maybe 20 plus patients a day. If it was really, really packed and we have a long day. Um, but, you know, having that message uh, in TV, I was reaching more than 200,000 people. Then uh, with a specific message that was key for everything else. And yes, it's a smaller message, but with a bigger audience. And I wanted to combine both. And um, following that, I, I had the pleasure and opportunity to work a lot with a uh, with a Hispano community in Chicago, and um, ended up in Fort Myers, Florida. Beautiful, amazing place. Real Florida, by the way. Uh, two hours away. Yeah, two hours away from 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 Miami. And um, one of the things that I had there was the, the opportunity to um, um, see what was happening with migrant communities on the field. I already experienced the rural part of it, the urban part of it. Right now, I was seeing the rural part of it, the, 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 the communities that were on the fields, picking strawberries, picking tomatoes. One of the actually poorest parts of the country, it's there in um, near Fort Myers called Imokali. And uh, there's there's no running water. It's fields, and and we were actually helping those migrant families there. Then uh, I spent there five years, um, and after that, I uh, I have an epiphany that um, I wanted uh, a, a something that will combine media, education, wellness, and all this stuff. And uh, my wife asked me, you know, what's the name of that job, or how how do I help you search for this? And I told her, I don't think that there's a title for the things that I do, and and you know, and and it's regarding media, social media, making sure that education is being transferred to, to the community, making sure that there's a strategy behind it. Um, uh, we were creating um, in, in Florida that we were creating weight management programs for kiddos, uh, very important, especially in the summer. Then th there was a lot of things. I love technology. I love translating. You know, using. Right now, you know, there's no excuse right now that we, we don't have enough apps or, or community culturally appropriate apps for commun underserved communities or communities of color. There's, there's, we don't have an excuse, right? right? And before is that the, 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 the technology divide right now is actually just making sure that, they, that we show them the way because we all have, if you have a smartphone, you have an email. If you have an email, you can actually have access to apps. And most of the 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 the, the tough ones right now have all of those things, and it's just making sure that we have time to teach what's mm -hmm. there, the opportunity there. And uh, I ended up in Altamed. Uh, thanks God, I have been here for almost four, four years. I'm the medical director for health, education, and wellness. Uh, also a pediatrician, uh, practicing pediatrics, oh, you know, a couple times a week, and I love it. And uh, the combination between Health, education, and wellness—the part of of, of uh, you know of, of the media part, and of course the pediatric part is a beautiful combination be because I, I get to touch from people from zero to 120. Right now, we we switch all the all the stuff that we were doing were was kind of face to face, and not a lot of videos, not a lot of media, not a lot of of of, of, of the digital part of it. But right now, we're moving towards that, and and I'm loving it. 
Lovely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, given the given the current times, Dr. Shapiro, what are you noticing in terms of the impact of COVID-19 specifically on Hispanic families? Well, it's quite interesting because a lot of people are asking me, you know, Dr. Shapiro, um, do you think that this virus has an affinity for communities of colors, for, for Hispanos specifically? Um, because it seems that they, they're being, you know, there, there's percentage points. It's not like 0.001%. It's like actually they're being statistically hit, hit harder than other communities. Um, and from the minority communities, is the Hispanos and African-Americans are actually suffering more. And um, I tell them, well, actually, this virus is just, uh, you know, the, the cherry on the cake. This has been cooking for 50, you know, like five, six, seven, eight decades. Mm-hmm. This is not something new. Whoever is actually like amazed that this is actually a reflection of what we have, that they haven't read, you know, anything about social determinants of health. You know, this was completely expected after so many years of, of, of defining your life by zip code. Defining your life of all that stuff that we now call social determinants of health, it makes a huge difference of where we are and where we're supposed to be. My learning right now, it's not a conversation of why are they being hit harder because we already have that answer. My question is right now, what are we going to do about it? And that's when I start the conversation. Okay. And and so it, so it seems like there's an impact of social determinants of health not only on the existing chronic illnesses and the patterns that we were sort of seeing and the impact on uh, from chronic illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, so forth, but all of that is now translating into this virus and how it is impacting these local communities. Um, so how are you know lower income minority communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19? And what is the impact that you are seeing on children? Um, I'm going to walk you through... Um a couple scenarios. One is actually the reality. Most of the Hispano communities are, are, are right now essential workers. They are in specific parts of the economy. They are the link of, of what we do every day. And they are kind of the basis of, of this, of, of our society and a lot of the things from, from most of the people that are picking up, you know, our fruits and vegetables on the fields to the people that are actually driving it the people that are actually serving it. Then we have, and I'm just giving a couple of, there, there's more, but you know, just to pick a couple of them. Then you have a lot of people that actually, first of all, even if they wanted to stay home, they cannot. And they need to start working and being exposed. And first of all, they, they don't have the luxury to stop for 14 days and, 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 and be at home. They need to go out and do their stuff because they're essential. Then they need to work. Then I'm more exposed. When you're exposed in certain places, like we, we have heard about the meatpacking districts, uh, we have heard about, you know, the agricultural fields. We we have heard about all these different places, and this is key because you know the only thing that we actually there's a couple of things that we actually know about this virus. One is that it transmits human to human. It goes from saliva, and after that, you know, social distancing works, our mask, and washing our hands. That's the five things that we actually know about this virus. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have a medication. We we kind of are still learning about symptoms, signs and symptoms. There's a lot of things that we're still getting there. But right now, the important thing is, what are we going to do with this? Um, are we going to choose to 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 um, evaluate the Hispano community and not do something? Because we need to understand that's a one, almost the largest minority on, on the country. Then. If, if, if you know already that you're having all these issues there and you're not investing in manpower, in, in, in um, educational pipelines, in actually creating services that are appropriate for them, and I'm not saying that they need to speak Spanish, but culturally appropriate for them, and, 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 and create that equity part of, of building on the system, this is something that is going to continue repeating itself. And, and, it's, it's, not going to, and it's not going to improve it's really not going to improve. Right now, we know if we invest in public health, we invest in those social, you know, like I have the pleasure, uh, my my entire team is 70 people. I have community health specialists. I have um, uh, nurses. I have uh, RDs. 
I have, you know, a, a, a master in public health. I have an amazing research. I have an amazing team that go. They, their only mission in life right now is making sure that social determinants of health are being taken care of. And right now we're moving to the basics of, you know, actually spending time with a patient, making sure that they need stuff. Um, right now, a couple of the wins that, that we are seeing and they're extremely important is we have a lot of patients that are the high-risk diabetics and we are actually going, right now there, there were a couple of them that were very sick with COVID and they needed food to be delivered at home. Then part of the community health uh, specialist, it's kind of promotoras, the salud, uh, they actually went, got food, touchless, drove it to the house, touchless and contactless and making sure that they actually had food. Because without food, you know, you, you cannot discuss medicine, you cannot discuss diabetes, it, it's the basic things of life. Then making sure that all of this are aligned, then, then we can talk about diabetes. Then now, now, okay, now you have this, you have food. Let's talk about your insulin. Let's talk about this. Then you start actually planning for the long term with the things that you have there. And a lot of the times is on reality. And, and one of the things that I'm liking right now of technology is that for the first time, we are entering back again to their houses to the to, to have that interaction with them. Because in the old times, I, I still remember my pediatrician bringing, you know, the, the little bag. With, uh, with 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 the shots, with with uh, the medications, and you know, taking he will take my blood pressure, absolutely everything. And right now, we lost that for decades. And right now, we we're thanks to COVID. That's one of the things that I am loving is that my 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 team is, is spending a lot of times and from from like since I was here, they have always been there for the patient, hearing them. And mo oh, some of the times, even though that I'm a physician, they spend more time than us. Hearing what's mm -hmm. happening with their families, what what, what anxieties or, or, or problems they're having, um, if they have transportation or not, like li little amazing things that can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And then, what is the impact that you're seeing on on the young ones, on children specifically? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I'm seeing, uh, and, and let me tell you why I think that because the levels of anxiety and depression, I'm probably going to start seeing the, the consequences with reflection of ADD, ADHD, something called oppositional defiant disorders and other stuff will start probably popping up afterwards. Um, right now, um, I, I, I have treated a couple of anxiety and, and, and kids that were having insomnia and a little bit of, of depression, but not as I thought I was going to be hearing from then. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, as a pediatrician, we were very into not making sure that the family is protected, meaning that, you know, if there's like issues at the family level with, with, with you know, higher tension and anxiety, making sure that the kids are, are, you know, there. And the other thing is, you know, the thing that for sure I'm seeing that we need to change is that um, we send a message to the community at the beginning is like, do not come unless you're extremely sick. And if you're extremely sick, go to the hospital and call us first because we want to make sure that you're taking care. Then right now we're moving to the second part. Okay, we know that COVID here is going to be with us at least 2021 at the level that we're having this type of conversations and probably afterwards until we have like a vaccine or medication, this will continue. Understanding that your kid actually needs vaccines. <laughs> that that will not stop. You, your kid actually needs vaccines and that's a very important thing that we need to do to make sure that they are growing well, that we touch them, we make, make sure that we're measuring them. Then how can we translate that? Then that's the message that we're doing right now as a pediatrician. And not only as a pediatrician, but, you know, yes, we have COVID out there, but, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, all this stuff are out there. And they are not helping us. Mm -hmm. And they will not stop then those are the things that we need to be making sure that right now that we're moving on the chronic space of, of, of COVID that we're taking care of that. Mm -hmm. With that, what are what are certain myths that you are seeing in the community right now as far as COVID-19 concer is concerned? And how would you bust those myths? I, I um, am actually going to do a public service announcement. I, I'm going to share with you my, the Shapiro diet. 
Okay. Okay. I'm going to walk you through all the meats that I have here from how to defend our body on a natural way until the other side. And the Shapiro diet is the next one is take a, take out everything that you're eating right now that it's bad. Meaning take away snacks, take away sodas, take away absolutely everything, make it hard for you to actually eat them. The harder and farther away from you, the better. Um, we're at home, we're spending many hours there. Then if you have the snacks, we're actually going to get them and we're going to use them. But make sure that you stay away. And people go like, no, but what about organic? Basic things, take away that stuff. And after that, we can actually have the conversation about everything else. The other thing is, you know, moving. Um, we, we need to continue moving. A lot of people are going, no, but, you know, I'm, I'm home, I cannot move. And, and you know, if you want to be healthy and you want to move stuff against coronavirus, you need to make sure that your that, that your body is at least as, as, to, as in tune as possible. Then make sure that you're moving. And one of the things that I'm doing with kids and with adults is that we, we are spending so many hours in front of a TV, a screen and everything else that we should actually use that first half an hour to move then when you're watching TV the first hour on your iPhone, whatever application, make sure that you're, you know, like you're marching in front of that. Because that way, at least you have that half an hour of exercise that you need to have in a wholesome way. And that's actually good for you, for your family, for everybody. And especially as parents, it's, it's a great example to do it with our kids. The third one is sleeping. Um, right now that we don't have any any type of, con, you know, like we, we're now getting to a certain routine, make sure that you're sleeping is an important thing and making sure that you're not going to sleep at 4 a.m. and waking up at like 1 p.m. Or if you choose to do that, understand that that will be hard to go back. Um, and, and the fourth one is very important about, you know, like about stress management and, and, and how are we perceiving? Because a little bit of stress, you know, when you have a lion behind you or a shark that it's went you know, you're swimming and you have a shark, you need to swim faster or run faster than the lion. If not, you're going to be the meal. Then at that moment, stress is amazingly well. You will survive. That's good. But right now we're moving and shifting to, uh, you know, like toxic stress. And that that's an issue that we're having right now. And making sure that we create like certain type of guidelines and conversations for, for our communities and ourselves. That we're exposed to all this stuff on, on TV, radio, and, and, and social media. Um, fifth one, that is actually the, the community aspect of it. You need to make sure that you're part of the community. It could be, you know, uh, your yoga community. It could be your 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 synagogue, religious, whatever. You make sure that even though that you're not going, but you're keeping in touch of that community, family, friends. That those actually are very important for for the entire resiliency part of your life. Um, understand that basic concepts. That's kind of the rules of actually defending yourself then we need to destroy the meats. A lot of people go like, Dr. Shapiro, I'm taking four tons of vitamin C and I'm trying to make sure that, my, and, and with zinc, by the way, and I'm trying to do this amazing thing with vitamins and the po secret portion of my grandma. And on reality, I explained to them that most of the food, especially here in the US and most of the world, it already has extra vitamins and everything. Then if you have like a semi-normal diet, you have enough anything that you need. And if you're doing these cocktails of vitamins, you're probably peeing them out. Then that will be your most expensive pee that you will have, or you will actually, you know, not using it. And then it's it's not worth it. It hasn't, we have tried, you know, with influenza, we have tried with so many other diseases and it's not working. The other one at the beginning was that you needed to actually start sipping water, hot water, um, around 100 plus every five minutes to make sure that you're, your throat will be moist and that way the virus will go directly to your stomach and will be destroyed by your acids, then, nah, yeah, it was a complicated one. The other one that I love was, uh, the, 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 you know, using certain household uh, liquids to clean your mouth and your nose. And all, all those uh, cleaning household things actually burn your nose and your mouth and can actually... Uh, very, very harm you and even kill you if, if you do that stuff. And that's one of the ones that I'm like, eh. um, a lot of people, uh, and I started seeing a lot of, uh, of dietitians and, and gurus, health gurus that uh, asking for like special formulas of, of plant-based uh, milkshakes and stuff like that. On reality, you know, sadly, um, we don't have any, trust me, 
I would love to tell yes to this, but we do not have, you know, and, and it's not that we were hiding information. We do not have anything evidence-based that will make a difference. Including, for example, right now, the, the, the I'm not going to say the name I'm, on purpose of that medication, but the, the medication that we were using for malaria and lupus, right now, most of the, 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 the research that was happening is actually closing down. Uh, because of of, of uh, risk of, of side effects without any um, help to the patient, meaning that we were actually harming more of the patient that we were using, helping them. Then using this type of medications for preventive purposes doesn't work out. Because this medication specifically has one, one thing that, um, one of the side effects is something called arrhythmia. That means that your heart actually starts beating differently. And this can actually create something called um, you know, your heart not to move. And without your heart not moving, then you have big issues. Then that that's why I, I'm not recommending at all this medication as the FDA or CDC. We know using the FDA and CDC guidelines, there's no recommendation that for, for that medication. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so with that, Dr. Shapiro, we're rounding up toward the end of the episode. How can people connect with you, learn more about your work? Uh, uh, Thank you for that opportunity. They can actually join any conversation that I have at uh, Twitter or uh, Instagram. It's at dr underscore s h a p s. Again, it's doctor dr underscore shops and also uh, drshaps.com. And uh, one of the websites that I that I curate a lot with uh, medical information screeners and stuff like that is the one that I, that I use here at work is the Altamed dot org um, website and it has a lot of information there and of course you know facebook Ilan shapiro md and linkedin for anybody and i'm always as you have seen um i'm always looking for uh opportunities to to share uh ideas to, to innovate and and to have this type of conversation and thank you so much for for the invitation it was an absolute yeah. pleasure to have you on. thank you you're welcome Thank you for listening to the Yumlish podcast with Shireen. If you like our show and want to learn more, you can find information at yumlish.com. You can also leave us a review here. We will see you at the next one. And remember, your health always comes first.